As we return to our series of sermons from the Gospel of Matthew after a few months away, we also return to this, uh, what we've called, series within a series on a particular sermon that Matthew records for us. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. We're near the middle of the sermon and therefore near the middle of chapter 6 where we pick up at verse 19, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. This is at page 811 in your pew Bibles. Now, I know exactly what you're thinking right now. You're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, we picked up at verse 19 on May 17. I remember it distinctly. And so why are we going back there again, right? I knew that's what you were thinking. And of course, you're exactly right. We have considered verses 19 through 24. So our text today technically begins at verse 25. However, verses 19 through 50 to 34 um, comprise an entire unit. Uh, And what we're considering today, starting in the middle at verse 25, really requires us to recall the context. Jesus is going to tell us this morning, do not be anxious. But you'll notice in the title of the sermon, and in the first word of uh, verse 25, it says, therefore... Therefore, which indicates that what Jesus about, is about to tell us is based on what Jesus has just told us. And uh, since it's been over three months now since we've heard it, we're going to backtrack a little bit and start at verse 19. And as a matter of fact, if I may beg your patience for a few minutes, please, I'd like to review, uh, since we've been away from Matthew so long, may it please you that I remind you that Matthew has an agenda. And that agenda is to set our eyes on the king, on King Jesus. He has been very, very deliberate about this. He spent the first four chapters laying the groundwork for us. Through Matthew's witness, we've seen Jesus' uh, lineage traced back through King David down to Jesus' birth as the therefore appointed and anointed king. This fact of Jesus' kingship, Matthew carefully underscored for us by the early witness of the Gentile magi from the east. Witness that is to his royalty, to his kingship, confirmed both by their words and by the gifts that they brought. Remember, gifts fitting for a king, for the king. Matthew went on to display for us the conflict of the kingdom's going on even in Jesus' early infancy and childhood and the slaying of Bethlehem's boys, holding before us as a foil that usurper of the title, the cruel king Herod in his maniacal attempt to destroy the true and benevolent king. Then there's that flight to Egypt, remember, and the return to Nazareth, all in fulfillment of the ancient prophecies concerning the king of kings. Matthew then treated us to further fulfillments of prophecy, of royal prophecy, through both the words of John the Baptist, who himself prophesied, you remember his line, remember what he said? The kingdom of heaven is at hand, and not only his words, but his work, and that of baptizing and thereby coronating the Son, Jesus, at his baptism at the River Jordan. You remember at that time that Jesus received the Spirit in full, without measure, and thereby was equipped for his royal and kingly work. Immediately thereafter, more clashing of the kingdoms as Satan and Jesus go head to head in the wilderness, remember, from which conflict Jesus emerges, the victorious king. So it's abundantly clear, isn't it, that Matthew's gospel is emphatically the gospel of the kingdom and of the king. Now, in November of last year, we turned the page of Matthew to chapter 5 and began studying this sermon that spans three chapters in Matthew, which we might as well just go ahead and call the Manifesto of the King. 
King Jesus is here giving us a manifesto, a declaration of his policies and, and aims, the aims of our lives, the aim of our life in the kingdom of God. He's describing how the subjects of his kingdom, namely you and I, are to live. What our priorities must be, what our character must be. King Jesus has been teaching us the sort of righteousness that must mark his people, a true righteousness, a full-orbed righteousness, an outward fruit, but also to the root, to our hearts. He started with what we commonly call the Beatitudes, in which he calls us to poverty of spirit. That is a, a sweet, submissive humility to our authorities, to, to God to mourning over our sin, our own and others, to meekness, to hunger and thirst for righteousness, to mercy and purity, that is, singleness of heart, peacemaking, rejoicing in persecution. Then, and with six examples, contrasts, or we call them properly and technically antitheses, Jesus demonstrated how our righteousness simply must surpass the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, else he says, we will never enter the kingdom. Then he turned our attention to moral matters like kindness, purity, honesty, and love. Three more examples of righteousness he supplied to us. Almsgiving, that is, charity to the poor, prayer and fasting. Along the way, Jesus, King Jesus has often compared us and contrasted us, his disciples, with the hypocrites, both the religious and pagan, in both our practices and the rewards that come to one and the other. In the case of hypocrites, the praise of men. In the case of his disciples, the praise and the reward of our Heavenly Father. More recently, however, in the sermon, Jesus has been leaving off the comparisons and simply devoting himself more immediately to our hearts and lives, to that greater righteousness he's been talking about that must characterize us. We've heard much about the secret rewards and heavenly throughout the entire sermon. In fact, the subject of treasure in heaven opens this section of the sermon, and Jesus continues, as we shall see, to cut right to the heart. Which brings us to the question then this morning, that this morning's re uh, reading raises, dear flock, and that is this, my brothers and sisters, what is the confidence of your heart? What is the confidence of of your heart. Last time, you might remember, the question is, where is your heart? Where is your heart? On what is your heart truly set? On the things of earth or on the things of heaven? That was the question our text begged of us last time. Now, rising from that question, is this one related to the first, of course, and what is the confidence of your heart? Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you that you are pleased to expose our hearts. It's uncomfortable to us, we confess. But we need it. We have opened those hearts of ours to you this morning. We've confessed that we've been anxious and we've been troubled about many things and we've not pursued the things that belong to our peace. Now, Father, we pray that you will banish that anxiety that we've confessed once and for all from our hearts by the power and the working of your spirit through the word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to pick up at verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, 
there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole, bo your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the, dark, if the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. In September of 1988, Bobby McFerrin released the first a cappella song to reach number one on the Billboard Top 100 Hits chart, a position it held for two weeks. Do you know the name of that? I'll give you a hint. Fourteen years after it was released, after it was released, one critic called it a formula for facing life's trials. Now, in case you still don't know it, I'm going to try to whistle a couple of bars for you. <laughs> Now you know it, don't you? Don't worry, be happy. Yes, sound advice. Don't worry, be happy. But the immediate question we must ask of Mr. McFerrin is this, why? Why not worry? You know, it, advice, counsel is only as good as the basis on which it stands, right? Right? Scan the lyrics of the pop song, and the closest you get for a reason not to worry and to be happy is this, whatever it is, it soon will pass. Hmm. Right. Jesus says, do not be anxious. In some, do not worry, Jesus says. In a sermon in which Jesus has been doing a lot of comparing, a lot of contrasting between himself, between his disciples rather, and others, between his disciples and hypocrites to pagans, this is one more way that we, his people, must be distinguished from those around us, must stand out. And perhaps never before in our lifetimes. Have we had a better opportunity than we have right now, this minute, to stand out as Christians and live distinct lives? I don't know a time in my life when 
when worry and fear and anxiety and angst and whatever you want to call it was running more rampant, was so much more clearly to be seen right on the very surface of our society than it is right now. It's, it's virtually palpable. It's so, as they say, it's so thick you can cut it with a knife. In fact, it even has a face now, doesn't it? Or rather, a face mask. The face, and an emoji on your phone, by the way, to match. The face mask of fear. Throw in all the other craziness of 2020, the violence, the market volatility, the impending election, and with a little heat, or a lot, from our obliging media, the cauldron of fear is now roll at a rolling boil, isn't it? Enters King Jesus and says to us, to you, his people, don't worry. Don't be anxious. Do not fear. But he's not like Bobby McFerrin whistling baseless niceties in the dark. He is bringing light into our darkness. He's shedding it abroad, our hearts and our minds. He lays a rock-solid foundation. We just sang about that, didn't we? He is my rock. Well, he lays a solid foundation for our confidence and for putting anxiety and fear to death, calling us to think, to trust, and to seek. Dear flock, we must not worry. We must not fear. We must banish anxiety from our hearts. And the way we do that is to obey King Jesus by doing these three things. These three things. Think. Trust. Seek. First, let us think. Well, think on what? Now, at this point, we might have expected Jesus to say, to go on and say, you know, well, think about Israel and think about the great deliverances of the Lord. Uh, for our fathers and mothers of old. Or, or think about all the great promises of God, and indeed, both of those would have been fine and very legitimate biblical lines of argument for our Lord to make. But surprise! Jesus has us think of a few unexpected things to dismantle and to dissolve our, our fears and our anxieties. I'll call them life, larks, and lilies. Think about your life first, Jesus says. What is your life? Well, now it becomes very important for us to chase down the therefore that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Like, like any good Bible exegete, when we come to the word therefore, we must ask ourselves the question, what is the therefore there for? We, what we've established now, last time was that our treasures are in heaven. That, that it is only heavenly treasures that will last. Jesus taught us that we cannot serve two masters, God and money. And we've committed ourselves to that life, haven't we? In other words, we can have only one allegiance, only one single driving force in our lives. Otherwise, we become confused, we become agitated, we become torn internally. Your heart must be set on the right things, or I'd say the one thing, which is the question we settled last time. And based on all of that, therefore, he says, do not be anxious. Now he applies those points that I've just mentioned, asking what is your life? How do you define your life? If your life is defined by how much you have, by how much you've accumulated, by how big is your house, by how new is your car, by how nice is your, are your clothes, and whether you have enough food, is that how you define your life? No. Your life is not defined by these things. We're, we're so tempted in this, aren't we? You, would, you confess it, and I'll confess it too. We are so tempted to define our worth, 
our lives, our life's worth by our net worth. And that always results in anxiety. It is a guaranteed outcome because quite simply, we are always in that case, either trying to accumulate more or trying desperately to hold on to what we've accumulated lest we lose it. But your life does not consist in things, he says. Your life does not consist in anything that's tangible. You need a new way to measure your life than by your checkbook and by your pantry and by your portfolio and by your possessions. Those things are not your life. They're not. And then he adds another point of logic for us to think about it is verse 27. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Fact is, none of us can make our lives a bit longer by worrying, but we can certainly make them shorter. Stressing and worrying, nursing anxiety, these things accomplish nothing but ulcers and strokes and heart attacks. Worrying over something has never, ever changed a thing. Not one single solitary thing in the whole history of mankind. Worry is useless. Worry is a waste. Worry is, quite frankly, stupid. Bobby McFerrin did get this much right. If you remember the lyrics in reggae cadence, in every life we have some trouble... When you worry, you make it double. That's exactly right. We have troubles. Jesus was a realist. We're going to have troubles today. That's the way it is. Sufficient for the day is its trouble. But when you worry about trouble, when you worry about today's troubles, and tomorrow's troubles, and the next day's troubles, when you start worrying about it, you actually double your troubles. That's all you accomplish, literally. You just double your troubles when you worry. Think carefully about the nature of your life, Jesus says. Second, think of larks. Actually, he says think of the birds, but I needed an L to go with life and lilies, and I figure you're more likely to think of larks than Lichmera limbata or Lichtenstein's kingbird. So he tells us, he tells us to become bird watchers, doesn't he? That's what he told us. The late Dr. John Stott was not only a stellar pastor and theologian, he was also an avid bird watcher. And he used to say, of course, that you know, he knew that his was considered by some a rather eccentric pastime and, uh, and that they viewed his kind with somewhat uh, quizzical and patronizing amusement. But he replied thus, I claim biblical, indeed dominical, warrant for this activity. Consider the fowls of the air, said Jesus, according to the authorized version. And in this, uh, this in basic English could be translated, watch birds. I'm serious, he went on to say. The Greek verb in his commandment means fix your eyes on so as to take a good look at. If, we will do, if you will become a bird watcher, you will be more like Jesus. <laughs> you will, because you will, with Jesus, appreciate the natural world around you. We'll notice why you're noticing the birds. that They don't sow, and they don't reap, and they don't gather into barns, and, but they eat. How's that? Your heavenly Father feeds them. Your heavenly Father feeds them. Third, think of lilies. A week ago, I went into the Meyer store to buy Debbie uh, some flowers. And for a long, long time, Walmart has been my go-to. But um, Meyer has an amazing selection. And don't tell Debbie this, but for cheap. Uh, as I walked to the aisle, what might have been a difficult decision was instantly made for me. I've never seen lilies so striking. I mean, they just took hold of my eyes. 
And these colors, purple and yellow, on the same petal, each bloom looks like a little firework. Who can do this? Only God. God can and does make such beauty. Jesus says, look at them. Look at the lilies. You worry about so many things. You worry about your clothes, maybe. Well, look at the way your heavenly Father clothes the flowers more beautifully than Solomon, the wealthiest, most powerful, fabulous king in Israel. And by the way, I've yet to meet a worried lily. If you meet one, you find one, just to let me know, will you? Even the grass, Jesus says, even the grass that lives and dies in a day is beautifully clothed by God. Martin Luther writes with great charm on this point. He says, you see, he's making the birds our schoolmasters and our teachers. In the gospel, a helpless sparrow should become a theologian and a preacher to the wisest of men. Whenever you listen to a nightingale, therefore, you are listening to an excellent preacher. It is as if he were saying, I prefer to be in the Lord's kitchen. He has made heaven and earth, and he himself is the cook and the host. Every day he feeds and nourishes innumerable little birds out of his hand. Charles Spurgeon comments this way. He says, lovely lilies, how you rebuke our foolish nervousness. I know you've heard this poem because I've quoted it to you before. Said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, Friend, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. Now, that's a delightful sentiment, though, of course, it's not entirely accurate, is it? Birds don't have God for their heavenly father. But you do. And your heavenly father feeds those birds. He cares for his creatures. And as much as your father, as their creator, cares for them, you may be even more sure that the father, your father, will look after you, his children. He will. It's an argument. It's a classic argument from the lesser to the greater. If God so cares for the birds, even sparrows, that as we'll hear Jesus say when we get to chapter 10, you're thinking, if we get to chapter 10, are sold for a penny a pair. Now, adjust for inflation. They're a buck a pair, right? And, and not yet not one of them falls to the ground apart from the Father. How much more does he care for you? And if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? But then he adds a phrase. O oh, you of little faith. That brings me to the second point. The first point Jesus makes is think. Think. Reason this out. Think it through. Reason with your own soul and your heart. Your Father knows all that you need. He loves you, and therefore He will supply all that you need. Simple, straightforward syllogism. Second, he says, trust. Trust. Oh, you of little faith, he says. You know, in the Gospel of Matthew, he says that four more times. And the Lord refers to his disciples as men of little faith. When they cried out in a fear in a storm on the Sea of Galilee in chapter 8, when Peter, walking on the water, lost his presence of mind and cries out, Lord, save me, in chapter 14, when they forgot bread, and now they're wondering where their next meal is coming from in, verse, in chapter 16. And when they failed to drive the demon out of the boy in chapter 17. In each case, the disciples were at that moment failing to trust the Lord for his provision in that moment, in that need. Now, 
start by saying, isn't it, isn't it, isn't there a little bit of encouragement for you and for me in this, that doubting and fearing and coveting and stewing and even being angry, we're not alone, right? Even the disciples who walked physically side by side with Jesus and saw all of that had these same struggles. We're not the only ones who have doubted our Father's provision and ability to provide and have even gone back, slid back as we do, back into the old way of thinking about our lives as if they consist of these things and our happiness hangs on having enough of them and at the right time. But we also need to hear the gentle but firm voice of our Savior to us at these moments as the disciples heard it clearly in those. Jesus is saying, I might have expected more of you. Knowing what you know, having seen what I've shown you, I expected more from you. There was no reason for you to doubt. There was no reason for your fear, but you did. Because your faith was weak and you were not putting it to work. I expected more from you than this. Dear flock, faith is not passive. Faith is, is like a muscle that we've got to work and exercise deliberately and, and regularly. Trust is developed and it grows stronger as it is exercised. Falling back into the pool, you know, into your father's arms or your mother's arms, it didn't come naturally, if you ever tried this, it didn't come naturally, did it? The first time especially, it is hard, it's downright scary. But you know that after you've done it two times and three times and four, five, six times, faith starts to develop, doesn't it? Faith starts to grow and to strengthen. It still takes faith to take the backward plunge, doesn't it? But it becomes stronger, your faith does, and more confident every time you do it. Trust the Lord, and then for the next need, trust Him for that one. And then the next time, trust Him again. And then trust the Lord again. And faith will become stronger and stronger until living by faith and not by sight be actually becomes reflexive for you. It becomes your go-to. I trust you, Lord. You've got this. It's only when we try to take our lives, when we try to wrest our lives out of our Father's hands, right? And take them under our own control that we find ourselves gripped by anxiety, by fear, by angst, and all the rest. The secret of freedom from anxiety, writes Sinclair Ferguson, the secret of freedom from anxiety is freedom from ourselves. It's freedom from ourselves and abandonment of our own plans. But that spirit emerges in our lives only when our minds are filled with the knowledge of our Father and that He can be trusted implicitly to supply, supply everything I need. That's why we pray regularly together in this house as we did just a few moments ago this morning. What the Lord has taught us to pray in the same sermon, by the way. Isn't that interesting? Earlier in the same, very same sermon, He taught us to pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. Thy will on earth as it is in heaven. These are bold, bold statements that you're making. I hope you understand that and that we're mindful of that. When you say that in God's house, you are saying very bold things. Thy will be done. These, these bold statements that we make, dear flock, are the expression of our personal commitment that whatever His will is for my life and for our lives, fine. That's what we want. That's faith. And brothers and sisters, faith is the grave of fear. That faith also, third, 
seeks. First it thinks, second it trusts, third it seeks. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, Jesus says, and all these things will be added to you. Another marvelous thing about Jesus, he doesn't say, oh, you don't need all those things. That's not what he says. He says, you seek the kingdom and you'll have whatever you need. If you haven't already learned this by experience, then hear this. You will never be cured of anxiety by getting more of what you have. You will never be cured of anxiety by getting more of what you already have or by holding on to what you've accumulated. That is a fatal, fatal mistake. Only the assurance that all of your needs will be met by your king can banish anxiety. And for that to happen, you have got to make the king's cause your cause completely and utterly to see his kingdom advanced and extended in every way that that kingdom can be advanced. And I mean morally, socially, geographically, as well as personally and inwardly and spiritually. When you have set your heart on his kingdom, when you have set your heart on this one thing, that his righteousness should pervade every area of my thinking and every area of my life and all my days and all my hours and all my thoughts and all my words and all my doings, then you will discover, as we'll sing in a few moments, all that I need, thy hand has provided. And there's another thing you'll learn. It's an interesting lesson. And as a matter of fact, you didn't need nearly as much as you thought you needed. All these things will be added unto you. That's what Jesus says. You make his kingdom your priority. All these things will be added to you. Isn't that wonderful? He will provide. He will. As, as anxiety and fear and uncertainty are just swirling all around us. Now, I think more than ever in our days, as the very foundations seem on the verge of collapsing under our feet, remember this, Christians, your God, your King, who rules over all, over all men and all events and everything, is your Father. Worry. <laughs> Senseless. It's, it's irrational, right? Helmut Tielicke, the German theologian and preacher, sometimes referred to as the German Billy Graham, preached a famous series of sermons on, on the Sermon on the Mount at St. Mark's Church in Stuttgart during the terrible years 1946 to 1948. His uh, congregation was living through the devastation, physical and psychological, that was the aftermath of the destruction of Germany and the humbling of its people at the end of the Second World War. He reminded them in a sermon of what it had been like to run for safety as the air raid sirens were blowing and, and to hear the fall of the bombs and to see the new destruction when they ascended to ground level after the attack, to see their homes collapsing in flames, to see their neighbors, their family members dead and dying. You know, what comfort could they possibly take in such a time from the Lord's remarks about birds and lilies? How could they apply his command not to worry about their lives and their living in such a time? Well, said Tilaka to his flock, I think we must stop and listen when this man, whose life on earth was anything but bird-like, and lily-like points us to the carefreeness of the birds and lilies. Were not the somber shadows of the cross already looming over this hour? 
of the Sermon on the Mount. His point was that this teaching, coming as it does from the lips of Jesus Christ, must certainly, therefore, be universally and absolutely relevant. And it must be as true in times of war as it is in times of peace, in poverty as in wealth, in sickness, or in health, in affliction and trial, or in prosperity and happiness. For Christ does not base his exhortation to us here to seek first the kingdom and leave the rest to him, the rest to God, on anything that depends on the circumstances of your life. No, he bases it on those things that never change, that never can change. The love of God for his children. The certainty of the victory of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And the promise of eternal life for all of you who will trust in him. Amen.